Good morning, Tracy. How are you doing? Hi, good morning. I'm good. How about yourself? Not too bad. Uh, just, you know, getting another week started. I'm in the Central Valley, so it's starting to get a little hotter. Oh, and, no. Eh, it's 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 part of living here. <laughs> okay. Now, you're having a big week this week because uh, tomorrow, I mean, some people have already seen it in screenings. Tomorrow, people are getting a, a first look if they wish. And then on Thursday, Friday starts the, the premiere of The Blackening. How excited are you? I'm so excited. I'm also nervous, but I'm excited. You know, it's it's interesting because it's, a, it's quite the difficult film to put together, I think, because mm -hmm. you're trying to balance um, a certain kind of comedy, I think, that to some people might be a little over. And then at the same time, other people might just find it hilarious because it's a, it's a kind of release and it's a kind of... Um, a way to to really uh, cope with things. That's uh, one time I was in a um, I was in a in a courtroom and they're like, "Would you laugh at a funeral?" And I said, "Yeah, I would," but it's because it makes me feel comfortable. Can you, can you talk a little bit about uh, of you know making sure the comedy f uh, was right for the film? I know you and uh, uh, Dwayne Perkins uh, wrote this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, Dwayne and I both are very, very silly and not afraid to make certain jokes and to kind of just poke fun of things and tropes that we know people re will relate to. And honestly, I've now probably sat through maybe 20 screenings, maybe more, um, and I have not seen one screening where people didn't laugh. And the the most nervous I ever was, was, was the first three, because that's when you're like, well, I don't know. We just made this and this could totally suck and people could hate it. And I don't know. And when those played so well, and those were like rougher cuts, I was like, oh, okay. I think the comedy is strong here. So luckily we I've never actually seen a screening, not play as far as the jokes, but I got to tell you, it was definitely nerve wracking making it because we didn't hold back. And you just, you really have no litmus test as a comedy writer sometimes until you're sitting with an audience. And I gotta tell you, that's the worst feeling in the world <laughs> when you're hearing it for the first time with an audience. Um, Cause if it doesn't work, it's pretty brutal. So, and luckily we didn't have to experience that with this, but yeah, it was, it was pretty great. What was the desire to make a film like this at this time? I, when I saw Dwayne Short, there was just something because I love, okay, I'll say this. I love horror. Like mm -hmm. I've loved it like in my entire life, but never really saw a way that I could justify my existence within it. Um, and that's what I thought in my head. Now I'm like, you can do whatever you want. But I was like, how can I do a version of horror? And then when I saw his his short, I was like, oh, this version of horror I could actually lend myself to in a cool way because it's funny and scary and it's very black and all of these things that I feel like I do pretty well and I just felt like we were ready for it I I think weirdly when I reached out to him we were not in the right time yet but I think post pandemic everybody's kind of looking for more escapist fun mm -hmm. like crowd pleasing stuff and I think it kind of is coming out in the right time in that sense but I think we were a little ahead of ourselves when I we first started working on it but now people are extra like I just want to laugh and not take things too seriously and the movie definitely does not take itself seriously um <laughs> you've seen it right yes I have <laughs> yeah I mean we embrace the idea that you know some of it's not going to make sense or some of it's just going to be really silly and don't overthink it um, and I think people are ready for that right now, to be honest. I have to agree with you. Uh, the last the last couple of years, you, I've seen a you know a rise in the popularity of horror, and I think it's because of what you said. You need that escapism, but now let's add a little mm -hmm. comedy to it. Let's let's take you know some of the things maybe that have been bothering us about the genre, and let's put it out there and see if maybe we can talk about it a little bit more. You know, do you think it can spark some conversations also as well as some laughs? Oh, absolutely. And one of the things that, um, without giving away too much, but one of the things that Dwayne and I debated, I actually like my horrors a lot gorier um, mm. than he does. And I, oh, it's hard to fully say what I'm saying, but the argument that he made was that 
people want to feel good horror. And I was like, what a weird pairing of like things. I was like, a feel good horror. I was like, does that exist? And he was like, we can, we can be that, but that's the, that was the tonal thing that he wanted to hit. And I have to tell you, I went to a screening, um, I hosted this one in Tallahassee and asked that question to the audience after they watched it and they agreed with Dwayne and they were like, I think because of so many stories of black deaths and black bodies and this and that in life, no one really wanted to watch like mm-hmm. a bunch of black people being tortured and, and suffer on screen. So they liked that there was kind of a feel good aspect to it and that like, the black people were victorious in certain ways and so um i think that's a tonal departure than you see from most horrors but that was a deliberate choice to kind of not make it feel disappointing when you leave or feel like oh i've seen that you know before because it exists in real life so much and what's the beauty of the genre is that horror can lend itself to, to very different avenues. You can you can do something that is a lot more gore specific or you can do something supernatural. Or you can do something with a bunch yes. of jump scares. And, and, mm-hmm. and I think that's kind of the direction you guys took a little bit more because, you know, you kind of what you do want to kind of root for the group to kind of stay together. Um All right. Let's stop there before we keep talking. Yes. <laughs> right. Uh, right. So yeah, let, uh, you know what? Let's uh, let's pivot a bit. How so from writing it, and obviously you said there was a short, but uh, I'm curious because I also asked Tim about this. How fun was it to to bring that game to life, and then uh, maybe some of the cards that didn't make it in the film? Yeah, I mean the game still cracks me up because I mean you can just any trivia can go into it, and so we wrote a lot that didn't, and it would still make us laugh even coming up with it. But we were, the ones that we landed on were the ones that like, no matter what made us laugh and didn't feel time specific, if that makes sense. Like there's certain, there's certain trivia moments that play really well in 2022, but maybe not like, you know, four years from now or, you know, in years prior. But when you're talking about like Fresh Prince, we were like that and Light Skin Aunt Viv versus Dark Skin Aunt Viv, it still made us laugh. And that's, you know, it's just like a classic black show. So you're like, it still plays. And and what's also great about it was that my mom laughed at that joke, but then younger people laughed at that joke too. So it spanned like a, a, a wide group, but we had a lot of fun coming up with those questions. And I think if there is a sequel, the game will have to somehow be a part of it, even if it makes no sense that this game shows up and wherever they are. But yeah, that's the one thing I do want to keep again. It it can make sense. We could we can take the classic (laughs) Jumanji trope where somebody unburies it and then or, you know, just it'll be part comedy. So it could be a very fun way. Maybe they find it at a Goodwill or something. I don't know. How are you in our heads? Yes, Jumanji was what we were thinking. We were like, well, if Jumanji could do it, then we can do it. Yes. Yeah, so it, it would it definitely would be fun. Um, I, w- I wanted to ask you how do you feel the cast did? Uh, because it, it you know it seemed like they had a really good chemistry. But what what I was talking to Tim about it was yes, they're all African American, but they're all very much different from one, each other. And I think one of our themes was uh, diversity with within a diverse group of people. Yeah, no, that's and that's awesome that you can see that. I think that was part of what I liked about doing the original short was when they were all debating who was the blackest. I was like, first of all, we all kind of sometimes do that. Um, and then two, we there really is a, a, such a spectrum. And we left out so many other versions of blackness. That's the thing. We didn't even cover them all, but we covered a really great diverse group in that sense. And I feel like that cast, and we we were so specific when we were casting because we what I don't like sometimes in horror movies or just any movie is when you have two characters that look and sound and feel exactly the same. And I'm like, it just feels generic to me. And, and you'd be surprised how often that's done where I'll be like, oh, wait, is that the guy? Oh, no, the other guy died. No, it's, him. you know, and you're like, no, you want to be very clear on who is who. And so with this, we made sure everyone looked and sounded 
different and had different body types and complexions and all those things to really like sell this idea that blackness is different visually as well. So that I don't think there's any one or two characters that you're confused about that you're like, oh, this person looks like that. No, no one looks alike, no one sounds alike, but they all fit in this group together organically as friends, but they're very different characters and have different backstories and backgrounds. And But that was all deliberate in the casting process. Yeah, I, I have to agree with that because I am part of a very diverse friend group that we each have our own ideas, but we're similar enough to where we can stand each other, I guess. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So uh, one last question. What made Tim Story the right person to direct this? Because I know he was kind of, um, he told me um, the group was surprised when he kind of like, you know what, I'll direct this. I was stunned. The reason I was stunned was because it's a micro budget horror. And I just was like, Tim is above this. He's not, he's not going to bother with something so small and beneath. <laughs> but then he just was like, no, it was really funny and I wanted to do it. But why I felt like we were so lucky to have him is because I think Tim is really great with commercial stuff. And with a micro budget, I think people assume if you don't have a lot of money, you can't make a commercial movie or you can't make a movie that packs theaters. And that's not true. So he took a very small budget, made it still feel big on the screen and feel like a crowd could enjoy it. But he's also really silly and good with comedy. So, cause he does a lot of comedies as well, but he's, you know, done a lot of action sequences and just, he has a wide variety of like skill sets that I think lend itself to the movie really well, but man, did he get the comedy right? That's where I was like so impressed because comedy is actually surprisingly hard to direct. I don't think people know that until you watch a comedy that's not directed well and it is brutal. And he just, cause it, you have to kind of approach it like you do other movies, but a lot of people think that comedy just means you you put a camera on actors and be like, okay, just tell a bunch of jokes and have it go on and on forever. And that's not what it should be. And he didn't treat it like that. He treated it like a real like studio comedy movie. And so I thought he just nailed it. I was so excited to see it and, and to watch him adjust because he had no money. Um, and he'd been working in the studio space for so long and he was like, oh, we can't do that. We don't have money for that. Oh, okay. All right. So then it would just be this, like going back to me and Dwayne and being like, okay, cut this because we don't have the money. So it was like a very much like great process as far as, you know, I'm concerned watching a director just pivot and adjust and cut and reroute the entire time. And we were lockstep with him. And yes, he was a perfect partner in that sense. He just rolled with the punches on this. So just as a quick follow-up to that, I just have to ask you then, what was for you the biggest takeaway in being part of that process? Like, what are you going to take away to your next film as far as um, maybe something that was like, oh, okay, we can do that. Even, even like you said, a micro budget. I always find it so fascinating how filmmakers can make sure their vision comes to life despite budgetary concerns. Yeah, I mean, I took, I found the blackening to be the most inspirational thing I've ever been a part of be, for so many reasons, but one, because we didn't have a lot of money and also we just didn't have, you know, huge stars, it, all, everything about it was, because Tim and I both went to USC film school and we would joke that it reminded us of our film school days in the best way, in the sense of like, we just got to make something and back in film school, I was so broke. I like had no money for anything, but I used to be really resourceful. And I used to be like, okay, we're gonna shoot in my apartment and we're gonna use my friend's car and blah, blah, blah. I think there's something that happens like the more you know accomplished you get in the industry where you get helpless and you act as if you can't do anything or, or make anything without permission or without like hundreds of millions of dollars or, you know, $50 million, you act as if movies can only be good and, and can only work if you have all the resources available and you have all these stars at your disposal. And this is not true. So what I think is inspiring about it and what I'm taking with me is that I'm not going to ever sit and wait again because I there's periods as, as a Black um, 
writer or filmmaker in general where we, we go in and out of style. <laughs> and sometimes like studios wanna make them and sometimes they're afraid of diversity. And th no matter what, the audience is still there. So you don't have to get their permission to do it. You can still service that audience and make something for that group that you know is like clamoring for your content with or without their permission. So the next movie I'm working on is another micro budget. I, mean, I kid you not, because I was like, I'm just, I just like making this. And I just, I found it to be really fun. And I don't have a lot of fun just writing stuff and waiting um, for people to like it or to say, we're going to green light it. So now I'm just kind of taking the power back into my own hands. And the blackening was just kind of a wake up call for me because that's where I started. So I'm like, when did you get to a point where you forgot that you're in the driver's seat and that you don't need permission to do stuff? So I hope that answers the question. But yeah, I'm very inspired coming out of this. Crazy, it's conversations like this that I, I do this <laughs> because oh, I good. take just as much out of it as as uh, everyone else and learning from your experiences also inspires me as well so thank you for your time congratulations awesome. on the blackening and uh, we look forward to your next project thank you i appreciate it all right have a good one thanks you too bye